Our last um, speaker for today is uh, Kathy Wang, Thank you. who is a, a social worker. She works with the Memory and Aging Center here at UCSF. She's had an enormous experience in dealing with a, a variety of problems that patients and caregivers face all the time. It's very difficult for patients and caregivers to know what services are available and how to access them. And that's what she's going to be talking to us about today. Kathy, thank you. experienced this before. <laughs> I myself have as well as a social worker. It's incredibly frustrating and so my I hope today is to link you all with some resources and information that you can um, apply to your situation or your loved one who has Parkinson's disease and also um, advocate for yourself and for your loved one. I want to preface by saying that um, I'm going to use persons with Parkinson's disease and patients interchangeably. I apologize. Um, so I uh, see my role as treating patients and families in a more holistic perspective. The patient pretty much has a multidisciplinary team. Not everybody has all of these folks, and not everybody has this little amount. I feel that the family and caregivers are really important and I wish I had more time to create slides just for them because they need their own support system. But today we're just going to talk about patients and then I'll later on talk about families and caregivers. So um, I feel that, for example, all of these people play a big part in making sure the patient's quality of life is maintained. Communication is very important, and I feel that my role is to ensure everybody is communicating on the same level and that the patient's uh, needs are addressed. Also, the family's needs are addressed. Uh, so, moving on. These are some of the topics I'm going to be talking about. These are the big topics. Education. What do you know about it? Do you know enough about Parkinson's disease? The what, when, ifs, and whys? The legal affairs, do you have all your paperwork in order? Uh, we talk about advanced directives and wills. Government benefits, our favorite, Social Security, SSI, SDI, all that exciting stuff, and then community resources. So, ask questions, talk to your doctors, um, join an organization or two, the American Parkinson's Association and um, PD Foundation are huge in providing a lot of resources and workshops. Um, also, attending conferences like this one um, is also a good opportunity to network with others. Joining a support group, if you haven't yet, it's really a great opportunity to have a space for yourself and meet other caregivers or even other patients who have Parkinson's that are experiencing the same thing. Um, if support group is not your thing, then I suggest also finding a therapist where you have your own personal space to vent, express your thoughts and feelings and experiences without guilt. Family Caregiver Alliance, you've probably heard of it, a huge organization in San Francisco that provides a lot of workshops and education, webinars, support to family and caregivers. Um, they, oh, I'll go back to that. Caregiver Resource Centers, we're fortunate in California that there are 11 of them. These resource centers, each resource center covers a certain number of counties. And what they do is provide local information, support groups, respite care, and so forth for that particular county you live in. 
I ref and here are some of the things that they, excuse me, that they <clears throat> offer. I refer families to these organizations, especially when, for example, I don't know what's available in Kern County. Um, we see a lot of patients at the Marion Aging Center from other states, but also in other counties in California that I am not um, familiar with. So they're a really helpful source for me. Okay, legal matters. Advanced directives is probably the newer form of newer term for power of attorney of health care or living will. And as you probably know, you have to designate at least one health care agent, up to three, or even five if you want. The person signing the form must have capacity. What does that mean to you? What does capacity mean? Does anybody know? In this instance, it's someone who knows and understands what they're signing. Someone who understands what this is all about. Okay, why they're completing an advanced directive. And the form needs to be notarized or signed by two witnesses. These witnesses don't have any responsibility for the person's health care needs. They are just people who know the patient to say that they are completing this form out of their own choice. They're not coerced to do so. One of the witnesses cannot be blood related, marriage related, all that. So I always tell families to find friends who know the patient. It's just easier. Or have it notarized. You don't have to go to a lawyer to complete this form. You can download it. UCSF has um, advanced directive on their website as well. Um, so now I have to test my memory about durable and spring power attorney. Um, I have my notes here. So durable power attorney, if you choose to create power attorney forms and not just advanced directives, durable power attorney means the person that you designate makes the decision for you now and when you become incapacitated. Springing power of attorney is when the person pretty much springs into action when you are no longer able to make decisions. It doesn't happen automatically like a durable power of attorney. Now, again, this can be catered to your own wishes however you want to. And um, I just want to let you know it gets a little complicated when you see durable spring power of attorney and then somebody has also advanced directives as well. Okay? Um, power of attorney for finances, almost similar to the advanced directive. You've got to have at least one healthcare agent. Person has to have capacity. It is created as part of a estate plan at times. And most banking institutions and brokerage firms already have their own forms. So what's happened several years ago, or many years ago, is that the person ahead of us kind of screwed it for the rest of us. They've been um, financially abusing folks. And uh, so now the banks have been very careful about creating their own um, power of attorney for finance. The person has to come in with the patient themselves and complete the form. You can't just download it from the website. It, it doesn't apply. Bank of America will have their own form uh, compared to Chase. So if a person has multiple banking institutions, brokerage firms, life insurance policies, then you got to make sure how to manage all that based on each company's um, policy or rules. Okay. Now, before I get into the government programs, I want to let you know about these three very important companies um, or websites. Disability Benefits 101, I just love. I found out about it this year from another organization. Consumer friendly, very easy to navigate, and a lot of information based on type of government programs. They have income calculators and very helpful um, to have. The EDD, um, that soon I'll mention again about it, but primarily folks go on there when it's for employment, finding jobs and so forth, but primarily for me, when I work with um, patients at the memory and aging clinic, it's to start applying for state short-term disability. 
Um, Canar, has anybody heard of Canar? It's California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. A lot of people don't know about it. One is because they don't do any advertising. Second, when people hear it's a nursing home reform, well, we're not at that state, we don't need to go there yet. They have so much information about legal rights, they protect consumers, elderly, and so forth in nursing homes mostly, but it's a lot of education about Medi-Cal, long-term care insurance, spousal impoverishment laws, um, and they also provide, um, did they say legal referrals as well? Um, and just kind of as a snippet, they will highlight certain nursing homes that um, have not done a good job. It's like bad nursing home of the month. They'll do that on their website. Uh, so that's CANR. All right, so very quickly, SSI, basic qualifications, 65 or over, disabilities, limited income, blind, disabled children qualify. SSP is a state supplemental program that I think 13 states, including California, has decided to add a certain amount of money to SSI. Um, I'm not sure how they calculate it, but um, Social Security Administration has worked with certain states who choose to participate to add the money to SSI. So this is the average. The maximum with SSI and SSP, you get about 900 for an individual and about 1500 for a couple. If you have SSI, you automatically qualify for SSP and Medi-Cal benefits. Okay. SDI, this is the California state plan for people with disabilities, cash benefits, uh, who have worked before becoming disabled. They pay you 55% uh, 55, 55 of your wages up to 52 weeks. Okay. It's a short-term benefit. Okay, SSDI is a federal program for folks with long-term disabilities. Um, you qualify for this insurance if you've worked into it or if families have um, worked and it's been paid into it, you've paid into it. This five-month waiting period is crucial. Um, it gets a little tricky. You can utilize all those three benefits and depends on your situation. So for example, if you are disabled um, for whatever reason, let's say um, you have um, increased tremors and you're unable to work on the computer and um, your physician agrees you go on physical therapy and maybe you'll be out of work for maybe six months, okay. But if your physician and your multidisciplinary team feels that you're gonna be disabled more than even a year, about six or eight months, you might wanna look into applying the SSDI. The thing is, if you are approved for SSDI, they will pay you on the sixth month that you qualify for. So that five months that you're waiting to get the money, you're hoping you still get the SSI to pay for it, or I apologize, the SDI to pay for it, okay? And I know it's hard because you're wondering, well, will I be able to go back to work here and then? It doesn't hurt to apply because what they're going to do is do a look back period and find out if at that time they have your application if you're still considered disabled. Um, okay. And you can apply for SSI at the same time if you also have SSI and SDI, right? This is SDI. The thing is, if you have SSI and SDI, um, your SSI benefits will decrease. And that's just kind of how the government figures it out for you. So this is why you go to Disabilities 101 and kind of figure it out um, your situation, how much you need, how much you don't need on their income calculator, okay? Okay, now the California Family Leave Laws. I found that there's two different categories. I was trying to figure this out. So when is the protected leave? We've all heard of FMLA. And California thought um, they should get a little fancy. The California Family Rights Act is their version of FMLA. Just depends on the um, situation, how they want to use FMLA or CFRA. Now, protected leave means you can take time off to care for your loved one. 
Okay, but it doesn't mean the job is going to be there. They don't have to keep your job if you take time off to care for a loved one. So, income replacement is the other category. This is where you apply for paid family leave. Maximum six weeks paid leave in a 12 month period. You don't, take it at, you don't have to take it at the same time. And the request for leave is not guaranteed. It depends on your work or company. You receive up to 55% of your wages. Now, income, the Paid Family Leave Act, you can, you're definitely guaranteed paid leave. However, it doesn't mean that you're going to have your job when you come back. That's why you apply for both. Okay. So, we have all know about Medicare, Medi-Cal, just briefly. These are the qualifications for both. Um, Medicare A, B, C, and D. Um, Medi-Cal, what I want to let you know is the Medi-Cal Recovery Program. Um, I'm so sorry, I don't have my notes. I'm not an expert on this. What I do understand about the Medi-Cal Recovery Program is that when the person has um, expired, Medi-Cal can um, try to recuperate the health care costs. And also, you have to make sure that the home is, if the home is still under the patient's name and the person expires, they can try to recover uh, costs also through the home. But this is the website to get more information. Um, one thing I want, ooh. one thing I want to mention about the Medicare A, when you need physical therapy or especially physical therapy, occupational therapy in the home, um, I know a lot of um, physicians will recommend home safety evaluation. Now, thank you. We know what that means. We want to make sure that the home is equipped with equipment, with the right equipment, durable medical equipment, the hallways are safe, and so forth. It's just that the physical therapist from a home health agency does not go in and just do that. They are paid by Medicare to help work with the patient from, for example, the waist down, ambulation, stability, and so forth. An occupational therapist works with the patient with their strength from the waist up, right? Um, conserving energy when they're eating or working on the computer, brushing their hair and so forth. So I just want to stress that when you are requesting or when a physician, anyone on your team is requesting a home safety evaluation, you want to be specific of what that means. And of course, getting home health to come in, the person has to be considered homebound or unable to go out of the home as often as they need to. Okay, or else, the home health agency won't come out or Medicare won't pay the agency. This group, California Health Advocates, is wonderful. It's for folks who have Medicare, they answer a lot of questions that's related to Medicare, like the ABCD, the drug plan, Medigap. Um, it's free and their opinion, they, they don't have any um, agendas, so it's very um, helpful. I've called them too. They're called high cap for short, so that might be easier for you to remember. All right, so the community and home-based services. All right, um, to get help in the home, of course, one option is to hire private caregivers from the uh, many care caregiver agencies that we have in the Bay Area. Um, I don't know if I would suggest looking at Yelp for reviews. That's a little, you know, um, you don't want to go on Craigslist, you don't want to do that. Uh, word of mouth is great, but I think um, speaking with doctors or even the team, your multidisciplinary team members to see if other patients they work with have other, um, have positive experience with other caregiver agencies. IHSS, um, it's a caregiver agency program um, for Medi-Cal recipients. A social worker comes out, calculates how much time it um, involves in caring for that patient, and then those hours are multiplied by the minimum wage, and that amount is given to your, what they call, independent provider or the caregiver. Now, 
Um, if you, this is for Medi-Cal recipients. Some Medi-Cal recipients, they make too much money, according to government. A thousand dollars a month is too much. And so they, but if you want to qualify, uh, utilize this IHSS program, they will have what's called a share of costs that you have to pay. It's like a co-pay to pay into this program. And the social workers will have to uh, let you know how much that is. They'll let you know before you decide you want to sign on or not, okay? So care managers, uh, they're great in the sense that if you don't have time, you're doing long distance caregiving, um, you're overwhelmed, it's really wonderful to hire them. It's not a long-term thing. You have a contract. I believe some of them do six-month contract. You can negotiate for a monthly contract. And they pretty much oversee everything. They make the appointments, they recommend the caregivers and so forth. They help figure out um, the type of paperwork you need based on your uh, situation. I, wrote, I put down MSSP and linkages. These are um, state programs that for MSSP, it's for adults 60 or 65 years older and are on Medi-Cal, the need case managers to come in, help them with organizing transportation, making sure they have IHSS and so forth. The thing is with MSSP, there's a long waiting list. But it's, it's there, the service is there. Linkages is the same idea, except it's for folks who are 18 and above and don't have Medi-Cal. They also have a waiting list, but it's worth inquiring. And of course, transportation. There are different types, of course, the most popular is paratransit. Um, but we've had some families who are very creative hiring folks um, a private caregiver to do the transportation and also to help at home. All right, so quickly, um, the different types of uh, living environments. CCRCs, there are about four or five levels of living. You have the independent, the assistant, uh, assisted living, the um, memory unit, and the skilled nursing facility. The independents, they are just condos or apartments. And then the assisted living level is where uh, you need help just in medication, administration, cooking, you choose not to or don't or cannot for whatever reason. Um, and uh, memory units are more popular in the assisted living facilities. Um, some are locked, some are not. Uh, board and care homes, they are uh, homes that have been revamped to have about six to eight rooms for patients to be in. It's a little more quaint and uh, folks um, I've worked with who have um, memory impairments sometimes like that. Less noise, less people, it's more cozy. But for others who are more um, engaging, enjoy being with others, the memory units and assisted living facilities are probably more appropriate. Skilled nursing facilities, you guys all know, is the long-term care facilities. Um, how are these paid? Well, um, all the way up to skilled nursing facilities, it's all private pay. With the slight exception of long-term care insurance, sometimes they will pay for memory units. Um, the VA, I believe, some of them will cover um, some of the facility, but skilled nursing facilities, Medi-Cal will pay. And then it's a matter of finding the available Medi-Cal beds. Um, so, Social Security uh, will pay for boarding care homes, just that the money will go straight to them. Okay. Um, all right. All right. The best part that I'm looking forward to. Okay, so aside from all the governmental benefits and then the advanced directive and so forth, I think it's also important to um, let you know what are some available positive and um, fun activities that's going to help boost mood and instill confidence. Um, I love this Arthur Ashe quote of starting where you are and use what you have and do what you can. Uh, this painting actually was done by someone with Parkinson's, and I found it really interesting in that um, he said, 
Without Parkinson's, he wouldn't have known that he could paint. Uh, there's community day programs. Adult day program is a non-medical model in that um, it's a place where people can go and socialize and so forth and have activities um, that are appropriate to their needs. Adult day health center is a medical model where a professional team of nurses, social workers, physical therapists, speech therapists, certified nursing aides are available. I threw in this Alzheimer's Daycare Resource Centers because uh, we do see Parkinson, uh, sorry, patients with Parkinson's disease who also have Alzheimer's, and it's also it's just nice for you to know that that's available for them as well or for your loved one. Um, that's a lovely blank slide. This is capturing grace. Have you guys seen it? Yes, the documentary. Um, I briefly was talking to it's the Parkinson's um, support group, and um, anyways, I just wanted to put a plug out there for this documentary. I actually think they did a show in Stanford yesterday, um, but it all started with this, uh, the Mark Morris Dance Group, and they teach dance classes to folks who have Parkinson's. Um, so. The Stanford website has a list of Parkinson uh, classes for folks who have Parkinson's. And um, this is the group, Parkinson's Patient Support Groups, who's here today. I um, was just looking through a lot of their classes. They have hula, yoga, tai chi, and so forth. There you go. There you are. Thank you so much. <laughs> I thought I threw this picture in there. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, okay, another opportunity to um, not just focus on your disabilities and what you can't do and how frustrating it is, the whole government program and whatever you might be facing. Meditation is a nice approach if that is your interest. Osher Center has a lot of classes, and also some dance classes, but uh, the Mindfulness Care Center is by donation, and they have weekly classes as well. Here are some respite information for families and caregivers. Engage as you age is mostly for, um, it's they pair up people who have, um, for folks who are isolated or even have memory impairment with their activity specialists. And what they do together is based on whatever the patient's um, interests and hobbies are. Lots of helping hands, have you guys heard of that? It's where you don't have to make 10,000 calls or monitor all your emails, who's going to do what, which day for John, and so forth. You, it's a calendar. You plug in certain days that you need help. Mondays, you need someone to help John, uh, help walk John's dog. Tuesday, he needs meals for breakfast. And you send it out to friends and family, and they log in, they choose and pick what day and what activity they're able to help John with. It's really great because that's all you manage. You don't have to call Tom and Mary and so forth. Um, and for meals, I just want to put a plug out for carrying meals and take them a meal. It's the same idea as lots of helping hands in that you, um, I'm sorry, same idea in that though the friends and families, they choose what meals they're going to make, when they're going to bring it, so that everybody can see that John is not um, starving or is um, being visited by someone. And it's just a big calendar where everybody can put in their thoughts and, um, and what they want to bring. I think it's a great idea. It's better than Meals on Wheels sometimes. And sometimes folks don't qualify for it. You know, it's, it's an ongoing thing. Um, so my whole um, goal today is pretty much to remind all of you that um, as caregivers and families, you're doing everything right. And for being here, it's, it's really wonderful that you want to learn more about what is out there, what to do with these, this information, and how that's going to benefit you and your loved one. And for patients who have Parkinson's, I hope you'll take advantage in taking a step back and really just maximizing on all the other activities there are instead of your condition and disabilities. So thank you very much for your time.